So Airbnb is I, one of many home sharing options that homeowners can do. Uh, home sharing, if you're not familiar with it, it's the short term leasing of your property, 30 days or less or under 30 days, in which you may rent out a guest house behind your house or you may go on a trip or let's say you're temporarily gone and you can rent out your entire home. Uh, there's several different sites, one of the number ones being Airbnb. So we don't always say we don't always mean the site Airbnb when we refer to Airbnb. Sometimes that's just a, a slogan for the actual, um, you know, usage of your home. So you uh, are kind of caught in the middle of a debate right now uh, over policy uh, or a city ordinance that could prevent Airbnb uh, operators from operating in two of them of uh, prominent neighborhoods in, in Ward Six. Yep. So the city has been working for more than two years to create or craft um, a balanced and reasonable ordinance to deal with um, the technical term is short-term rentals. Hmm. Um, affectionately, it's been called the Airbnb ordinance just sure. for, for shorthand mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. And so I think you did a great job, Lennon, of describing it because it, in and of itself, it is... Um, covers a wide span of activities. The company, Airbnb, was originally founded by two guys who let somebody sleep on an air mattress in their living room. You know, the story goes that one of the two principals was at an art festival. He sat down, he was having a beer, a guy came along and joined him, they started up a conversation. And uh, as he said in his own podcast, you know, he said, I asked the dreaded question, which is, where are you staying tonight? Mm -hmm. And the guy said, well, I don't know. I don't really have a place to stay. <laughs> and, you know, he, he said, yeah, there I was. And um, so I invited him to come stay with my wife and me. And we put him on an air mattress. And he said, during the night, we thought, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> we mm -hmm. don't know this guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, from that comes this global industry uh, worth billions of dollars where people are able to monetize excess space that they have. Mm -hmm. And it has mm -hmm. really morphed from mm -hmm. sleeping on your couch to uh, you might have a mother-in-law set up in your home where you've got an extra bedroom that has a bathroom and a separate entrance. Um, you might acquire a small home or you might have inherited mm -hmm. you know a small mm -hmm. bungalow in in my case let's just use class and ten pen as an example mm -hmm. right near the plaza sure. district you know you might own a small home that you don't live in mm -hmm. that you fix up to a very high standard we all need to remember that airbnb is much like um, uber or any of the other sharing economy th type um, uh, businesses today where you live and die on your ratings and so, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. one is naturally incentivized to keep the property up, to make it really cute, to offer amenities um, so that you keep your ratings high. Right, uh, right. And that's an important check and balance in the absence of, you know, lots of um, calls to the, to the police or, you, mm -hmm, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think there's a... Uh, a leveling a out self here, a self monitoring is sure. what is a word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've been trying to uh, craft something that would apply citywide, and uh, and I think from the city's perspective, and I, I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not even speaking for my eight colleagues, but I think, you know, from the city's perspective, um, we recognize that Airbnb home sharing is here, mm -hmm. and we'd like to know who's doing it because at the moment it's kind of underground mm -hmm. so we'd like to know who does it we'd like to have them have a license of some type so that if there were to be an issue a nuisance issue noise parking some of the things that could occur we'd like to be able to yank that license for a bad operator mm -hmm. and we also would like to level the playing field um, for the hotel motel industry mm -hmm. and require that these people meet certain safety requirements and that they pay taxes just like a mm -hmm. hotelier the does tax. the sure. lodging tax which for those that don't understand lodging tax is a 5.5 percent additional tax so basically a sales tax on top of your existing sales tax for the service 
correct. So um, that was, you know, it was sort of the simple beginnings uh, where we started. And when we began to um, ha hold public meetings related to those simple concepts, um, certain neighborhoods, and particularly some of the larger historic neighborhoods, uh, became concerned about not knowing who was doing it. They're concerned mm -hmm. about, uh, would like n notification if their neighbor is going to use their home as an Airbnb. They'd like to know that. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discussion about requiring that um, homeowners be present. And, mm. and this is, you know, again, to try to protect neighborhoods from noise, nuisance. You know, one of the examples that's frequently given is, you know, supposing a bunch of, um, you know, young guys come into town for a bachelor party or for a thunder weekend mm -hmm. and rent mm -hmm. out one of the large mansions in Heritage Hills and have 10 bedrooms full and, you know, party all night long and have cars all over the street, you know, that would be disruptive to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's been language proposed that would um, prevent that from happening. So there have been lots of suggestions about how we might do this. Um, I have been, you know, on a scale that is 180 degrees different, I have literally been accused of destroying democracy by interfering with people's private property rights mm -hmm. by those that would like to do Airbnb completely unfettered without any regulation. And on the other hand, I have been accused of destroying neighborhood property values by allowing short-term rentals to come mm -hmm. into the neighborhood. So this is a very polarizing subject. Mm -hmm, sure. And um, overlaid on top of that is our municipal experience with Uber we spent about two years plus trying to work um, on ride sharing. You know, we had a robust, uh, robust may not be the word, but we had an active taxi industry that mm -hmm. was concerned about ride sharing entering um, into the marketplace. And so we worked to try to, again, level the playing field a little bit, mm -hmm. remove some regulations on the taxi industry, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. allow for, um, folks to know who was who their driver was in an uber situation and mm. have some assurances that the vehicles were properly maintained and things that i think people would expect the city would know and uber and lyft both went directly to the state capitol and mm. lobbied for no regulation interesting so two and a half years of work at the city level went away and we were what's called preempted mm. um, from enacting any municipal regulations that were any more uh, onerous than those at the state level. So let's talk a little bit more detail about what what the actual proposal is. So from what I understand, this would be an annual permit that you would apply for to identify that you are uh, an Airbnb or a, or a, or a, a short-term housing um, host and then that would also register you for the lodging tax. Is that right? Well, it's the original ordinance as it was first proposed, um, it, uh, levels the field so that whether or not you're a hotel or whether you're not you're an Airbnb operator, mm -hmm. you would be required to get the same simple license that costs twenty four dollars. Hmm. That's the first step, and okay. that would and that identifies who you that are. would essentially register gotcha. you, identify who you are, where mm -hmm. you live, what you know, some very simple things. Um, and that would set up uh, the opportunity for you to pay your, mm -hmm. your lodging, lodging tax. tax. Sure. And it would let the city know if you were conducting this business and were not doing so. And just in a short answer, I know it's a, it's a complex deal, but the purpose of the lodging tax is, where does that funding go? Well, um, at the moment, um, it's d divided up um, all, when you go stay, you know, as an example, if you mm -hmm. were to stay at the Skirvin, mm -hmm. there would be a lodging tax mm -hmm. that's um, attached to your hotel bill. Mm -hmm. um, a significant portion of that goes to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Gotcha. And so it directly improves the city. Directly improves the sure. city. And, you know, so, you know, if you're the Skirvin and you are required to collect that 5.5% mm -hmm. and your competitor in Class and 10 Pen doesn't have to collect that 5.5%, mm -hmm. 
they're at a competitive advantage. Sure, sure. And so, you know, I, um, you know, one. And the can, city loses it, at the end. One yeah. can certainly recognize that uh, visitors to a city. Mm-hmm. Just like people, as we discussed, you know, the options for living here, mm-hmm. people would like every option for um, lodging choice. Sure. And there are lots of reasons why mm-hmm. staying in a, you know, a bungalow or staying in a home with mm-hmm. a kitchen mm-hmm. um, Washer and makes dryer. sense. I mean, when we travel, uh, our kids are were in re- reusable diapers. We were really into the crunchy movement of, of being able to use reusable diapers, which makes it really tough to stay in a hotel. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so th- I mean, that's uh, almost a must for us. And then finding washer and dryer in a hotel, maybe it's in a community room. It's just really hard. So Airbnb uh, gave, gave us that opportunity. Let's talk just a minute about... Um, when people look for an Airbnb, uh, they're usually getting a better deal right now, currently, than than they would pay in a hotel. Not uh, necessarily. Let me. Okay. Airbnb has been working very closely with the city, mm. uh, not just over this ordinance, but also in the um, collection of the lodging tax. Mm. So not every site, but Airbnb at the moment voluntarily collects the tax for the city of Oklahoma City. Excellent. So they are remitting sales tax. And, you know, I, th- I think there are um, in excess of 300 Airbnb sites that are currently operating mm-hmm. in Oklahoma City. Um, the majority of them, by, by far and away, the majority of them, by, um, you know, well-run, well-intentioned operators. Because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. well, they have to, because the rating system. Because of their rating sure. system. You know, it just doesn't mm-hmm. stay as a viable Yeah, yeah these uh, are real property. people trying to rent it, and they can read reviews right there. Right. I mean, terrible experience, unclean place, you know, unkept, and nobody's booking a place there. And we yeah. really haven't had any complaints, mm-hmm. which is, you know, another thing that's, that's very important in this process. Yep. So, yep. you know, my hope is mm-hmm. that we can come to some form of a resolution that would allow us to have a citywide ordinance. Mm-hmm. There has been some discussion about having sort of a baseline ordinance sure. that may be this very simple thing. Mm-hmm. And then overlaying in the historic neighborhoods, maybe a little bit more regulation where you know perhaps you would have to go to the Board of Adjustment and get a special exception in order to operate an Airbnb. Mm-hmm. So in mm-hmm. that case, your neighbors would be notified. They would have the opportunity now this exception is where we start getting expensive. It, it gets a little bit expensive, yeah. but what that's an, it's a normal exception is what twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. Yes, but the council has the uh-huh. opportunity to set that, and the fee that we've discussed is three hundred dollars. Okay, so if we're renting out the place, and that's for good for one year, or that's no, life? that would be that would go with the property. So that gotcha. would be a one time. Special exception fee. It's now, almost like a redistrict, a rezoning it kind is, of thing. I mean, in essence, this is a rezoning. Interesting. A number of people okay. are looking at it that mm. way mm. because it's, it's taking a, com- a it's kind of a commercial single sure. family property, typically, sure. and using it now for an income producing property. Mm. So, you know, the historic neighborhoods, many of whom I represent, that have fought so hard for so long. Mm to prevent commercial encroachment hmm. from coming into their neighborhoods now view this use category as exactly that. Hmm. So there's a ton of emotion surrounding this issue. And, you know, I think there's a valid argument to be made. Some some have said, you know, why would you single out a historic neighborhood over the rest of the community? But the historic neighborhoods have already been singled out. Mm, That's why they're their nature. designated sure. as ex- as historic neighborhoods. True. So it's not um, doing anything out of the ordinary that hasn't already been done. So, you know, we're working hard. We're on one side. Um, we are trying to fight preemption mm. because I think if this lands on the doorstep of the Capitol, we end up with no rules and nothing that any of us can do. So... We're talking to Airbnb. We're talking to some of the other folks to, you know, get a feel. We've it got. It would have to be citywide, I think. Yeah. I, I, th- I think the issue is coming when when we try to say these two neighborhoods get it, but nobody else gets it. Um, 
That is, that that is a difficult move. Yeah, but I want to be I really clear state level. that getting it mm-hmm. is not necessarily what everybody wants. Mm. Some mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. don't want Airbnb in their neighborhood, mm. and they would want the additional protections. But there are as many people in as many other neighborhoods that want none of those requirements. Mm. They would just like to be able to do Airbnb. So right, right. I, I can't option. even sit here t- today and say that you know that many people in Heritage Hills think that having the additional requirements is a good thing. Mm. You will get a ton of calls about this mm. because people don't want it. People are running, you know, monetizing. Um, sure. What we're talking space about though is we're talking about our economic or our financial burden of. Three hundred and twenty-five dollars your first year. It, yeah, one time. One time. Yeah. And then the twenty-five dollars is is an annual, on, ongoing, which is is not. I mean, that's that's. I've seen cleaning fees of one hundred and twenty-five dollars or more right. on one Airbnb charge. So right. I think we need to get clear on this. The original, you know, news <laughs> stingers. You know, these headlines saying that. You know, Ann Salyer is, or, or Meg Salyer is, is going in and and um, you know closing down Airbnb. She's you know, you know, invading your property rights and all these other things are are not quite the full truth here. Nothing if, is further if, from the yeah, truth. If anything's, it's not the truth. It's that we need a way to make sure that it's stable for the future. You're not saying let's not do this. You're saying. Let's do this in a way to where everybody can benefit, uh, and that it's and that it improves our town versus have this risk right now. Just wild, wild west. Everybody does what they want to do. There is a, a potential for investors, um, you know, especially investors that don't even live in the state, to purchase a property and then completely convert it to an Airbnb and then have a service company uh, manage that property and do the Airbnb for them. And I think that model actually could be a great opportunity for some locations. Uh, and I know that those servicing companies um, have, they like for example, we can't get them on the show here because they've literally been in the shadows you know, trying to run a business of maintaining these Airbnbs for these investors, but uh, they can't come out officially saying that they're doing that. Well, I really would like to emphasize that that extreme example mm-hmm. is exactly what most neighborhoods are afraid of. That's correct. I think that we need to have that discussion, though, and and the reason why I bring that up is a few of you listeners remember when we talked about earlier in this year, Inman, who's one of the largest um, realtor uh, discussion and research panels. I mean, they're like they're like uh, the hot topic discussion. Uh, it's like two hundred something a year to join their membership, but they did a study on secondary mortgages. So. Folks that have filed in the United States for a mortgage other than their primary dwelling, and folks that have folks that have fired, filed for a mortgage other than their primary dwelling, like a secondary mortgage, um, is now 15% of mortgages in Oklahoma City. Wow. Now, when I look at the ranking, I mean that was a national article. It said you'll never guess who's number one, and it was Oklahoma City, and that's above Miami. Wow. I mean, when you think of Miami, right, you, you think, of course, it's it's investor-owned and all this. Uh, but when we exceed that in, in the amount of uh, secondary or investment mortgages, um, that's really starting to say something. Linda, uh, does it break mm-hmm. it down in any way to property value? Because, you know, in my opinion, mm-hmm. I just don't see any way that you could make the economics pencil out if you were to buy you know, a 10-bedroom Heritage Hills home No, and yeah. try to convert it yeah. into Airbnb. There's just no possible way. That's this correct. This works, and mm-hmm. it works really mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. in neighborhoods um, like Class and Ten Pan or Shepherd or, you know, some of the smaller... Mayfair. Mm-hmm. C- very cute, mm-hmm. you know, neighborhoods with mm-hmm. two bedroom, one bath bungalows mm-hmm. 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 that work, you know, for your family or for mine. Sure. You know, that um, you you can see how that would be an attractive investment. Mm. As you start to move up the value chain sure. on, you know, some of these homes, I just don't think there's 
anyway. Um, I agree. That, that makes well, sense. Well, we have to, as investors, we look at that that one percent metric. So if you buy a house for two hundred thousand, you need to be renting it for two thousand dollars a month. And as we start to get higher in value, it's really hard to get that right. rent. And if you know, even if you do, that person's only staying there while they're building their home, or you know, it's uh, they're waiting for to shop around for a home that they're going to buy. So it's really not even a long term tenant. So it doesn't work. That's right. Yeah. So I think I think that needs to be brought up in that discussion. Uh, if you have a property value and you can look at the statistics, once you get over, let's say that three hundred thousand or two hundred fifty threshold, um, yeah, the metric totally changes. Yeah. I think and you're so, right. you know, one yep. of the things, kind of, that we've bounced around as a way to to manage this mm-hmm. is um, the number of rooms that you could rent. You know, supposing we had mm-hmm. an ordinance and it could be, I think this could be an easy one to apply citywide. Mm-hmm. That said, if you um, you know, had a property where you wanted to rent in excess of four bedrooms, mm-hmm. you would have to get a special exception permit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would mm-hmm. require you to notify your neighbors. Right. And, you know, that would trigger that higher fee. Mm-hmm. But that would... Our square foot size. Pro- I mean, when we think right. about square foot size, we think about occupancy fire regulation, right? right? So that could be a, a contributing factor. Um, also, though, you've got you know, half a million dollar houses that are 1,200 square foot in our city, you know, all the time. Uh, So, yeah, it's going to be difficult to actually draw a line to where, I mean, definitely on the mansion side, but I don't, I would think that's just a small fraction of what Airbnb is. I mean, I think it's more, um, like you said, uh, smaller families or Thunder Game events, because that's really where they get their peak pricing is, is around events. Mm-hmm. And when there's a concert here, Garth Brooks comes into town, right. where is everybody going to stay? Uh, those kind of things. And now with Scissor Tail having that 15,000 uh, seat, or not seat, but uh, standing room, or not really standing room. It's Sitting the, the, room the, on the hillside. The, the hillside, the lawn, the, <laughs> the great lawn. The beautiful great lawn, yeah. 15,000 people. I mean, that's huge. I think uh, a Thunder's Game is uh, 18,000, yep. something like that. That's capacity. So, oh, that's a lot of people. But remember, yeah. most of us live in Oklahoma City for the yeah. Thunder Games. So. True, true. Uh, but, you know, with us, you know, I mean, it, 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 I guess it all depends on how the score goes. <laughs> it's who's in the seats there. But, well, uh, we've definitely had a great discussion today. Thanks for coming by. Uh, 